welcome to episode five of Cross Ice Pass. I'm your coach, Steve Mosier, and the season is about to start, folks. Um, as I record this, the last preseason games are being played, and it has been a really lovely, warm couple weeks seeing some pretty fun things happen in um, in the preseason. Um, but so we're going to summarize a few things that um, I'd like to talk about before getting into my Eastern Conference predictions. Um, the th- the basic thing is first off. Connor Bedard, I think, had a wake-up call, which is obvious. He showed a few moments of greatness and a really wild moment with uh, Theo Fleury in the shootout against the Wild. I'm happy that uh, Luke Richardson gave him a lot of minutes in the preseason. I think everyone will have their eyes on on, on his first game against the Pens on Tuesday. Um, and we'll see if he scores a goal in his first game. Quite possibly because Jari is a sieve. So, um, but that's another story for the Penguins to to, to deal with. Um, the Panther um, Spencer Knight has been sent down to the AHL affiliate Charlotte Checkers. Um, I like talking about this kid because um, his, his mental health issues and the issues of of it, you know, behind the scenes that has been unfortunately publicly talked about. Um, it's pretty. It, I, I'm, I'm rooting for this kid. His future, he's going to be a future star. He can get things back on track in Florida with uh, Bobrovsky getting older and consistent, and his consi- and Bob's consistency starting to change. Um, they'll really want something positive out of this story for another chase um, to the cup and to go deep into the playoffs like they did last year. Um, I think it's going to be important. Uh, the Devils, the Kings, Calgary, and Detroit – um, hit hit the net more in the preseason, um, but the one thing I want to mention, and it's a it's a bit of an old rivalry between the Devils and the and the Red Wings, is that the Devils and Wings were lower on goals against, while the Kings and Calgary were a bit more um, 50-50 on their on their uh, goals for and against. Um, as this is you know being aired, there's probably some other goals happening. Um, I know the Devils uh, were were, uh, were schooling the Islanders, so hey, it's uh, the the offensive um, juggernaut of the Devils is definitely going to be something to, to keep an eye on. Um, Pat Verbeek uh, and the Ducks got Zegris and Drysdale contracts, but are they enough? Of course, these two players um, are great players. They're going to be good. They're going to be superstars. If they stay healthy, um, the biggest part about it is that they're making less than their counterparts across the league. Guys that were drafted in the same year as them, guys that had kind of the same similar issues with them. So I don't know. I think Verbeek's experience in Tampa and Detroit's front offices with Steve Eiserman might be, you know, because those front offices have a tendency to underpay um, and wait for development instead of kind of like, put a big chunk of change in their pocket first. Is that going to be a problem at Anaheim? We have yet to see. I still think Anaheim is going to be a team on the, on, on, on the up for sure. Um, how many players waived could have some impact on other team and another team? We shall see. Um, lots of way. Well, you know, that, that's just normal in preseason. There's a lot of guys that are waived, let go, um, get out of the program. But my biggest thing about it, and I love to see it always, is these guys that are on the bubble in the ECHL, um, in the AHL, and in the NHL, whether they're hopping back and forth between leagues, um, you know, maybe a new, a new change of scenery, um, a new team for some of these players could really, uh, could really benefit them in the long run. So, the so preseason was great. Um, you know, it's great to have hockey back. There's still some crazy stuff happening in the KHL, the Swedish league is uh is 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 moving forward right now they're kind of a, a few weeks or about a month ahead of the nhl so so keep an eye on all of that the pawhl which we talked about in a couple episodes um nothing seriously moving on that um i don't know they say they're going to start this in january i don't even know what rink they're at i don't even know what the teams are called so um 
I really, really would love for these announcements to be happening more often instead of kind of, you know, at the, at the back door of, of the major, uh, major leagues. So Eastern conference predictions. Wow. So in episode three, I gave my cup contender in the West as the Dallas stars, which I think the Dallas stars are going to be there at the end of this, uh, conversation. I have a feeling that you're probably not going to be happy with, uh, my Eastern, um, pick. I would rather it be the Detroit Red Wings, but that's not going to happen. Maybe not this year. <laughs> um, this, the, this conference is going to heat up some rivalries between the Bolts and the Panthers playing so much, the Bees and the Leafs, uh, the Hudson River rivalry between the Devils and the Rangers, and the aging Pens and Caps trying to stay worthy. Um, the biggest part about that is still got to keep an eye on this Ovechkin thing. He's 72 goals away from breaking Gretzky's record. Uh, the way he's been playing, the way he's been scoring, that seems, that seems possible. I don't think he's going to score 72 goals this year, but it would be really great if he got 40 and then next year or, you know, the year after that, um, which he's probably only got three years left anyway, he'll, he'll kind of dig through and uh, break this record, which is great for the development of the sport. Um, and it's just going to keep going with that because Connor McDavid could ch chase him. Who knows? Um, we know Toronto, Rangers, Devils, Carolina, and most likely, you know, they're, they're kind of like the, the likely the favorites. So, but who fills in, um, the other four who will squeak out of the Metro. It's going to be a battle between the Isles and the pens. Like last year, the pens didn't make the, the playoffs by two points. Uh, my thoughts are that the pens took more chances and added more than the Isles did this off season and will squeak into the fourth playoff spot in, um, in the Metro. Um, because it's, it was only one win that they were out last year and they added Eric Carlson. Um, they've got, uh, Riley Smith. So they've got some pretty good weapons that they've added. So I think the caps are no longer dangerous. I know I just said Ovechkin's going to score and blah, 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 blah. The caps are done. I'm sorry. Washington Capitals fans, if you listen to this, if you want to if you want to come to my house and, and smack me in the face or something, I don't care, but the Caps are done. It's gone. Sorry. Um, you guys got rid of your, uh, your goaltending chances. Your defense is getting old. The entire team is getting old. There's no young talent that's on the, that's on the team that's really going to take you forward. So sorry, Caps. Um, this is going to be a tough year for you as fans. Um, Columbus. Columbus has a lot of good firepower. Um, they've been drafting really high. They've got Owen Power. They've got uh, Fantilli. They're not there yet. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, I don't know. In six months, you might might change my mind about that. But Columbus, no way. Um, since three of the four favorites are in the Metro, let's make the Atlantic a wild goose chase, which it's going to be because my, my wings are in there. Um, is Boston still worthy? Um, they won't put up the points like last year, I think. I don't think they're going to get the President's Trophy. So is this year the right, the, uh, is the writing on the wall for Tampa and this whole Stamco situation and then kind of getting rid of some veteran players? Um, I don't know. Is Florida still loaded enough? So on top of that, all of this is, is this the year that Buffalo, Ottawa, or even my boys in Detroit squeak in. Um, and we'll talk about that in a sec, but I think Florida is still worthy to not only be in the playoffs, but go far. <clears throat> I think getting to the cup and playing as hard as they did through the playoffs I, and upsetting the teams that they did through the playoffs, I still think they have a chance. But, and that's a big but, is that uh, Radko Gudis is – you know, was a hard-hitting defenseman. He was demolishing everybody. He was very hard to play against. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about that a lot um, on this podcast, is that I don't care how many fighters you have. I don't care how many big big contracts you got for guys that are normally fighters. But you have to be a player that's hard to play against. You have to be a player that's hard, that uh, people are scared to hit. 
um, or get around because they get hit. So anyway, the Panthers without Radko Gudas going to uh, the Ducks, that's going to be tough. I also think that them losing Anthony Duclair to the Sharks, he's a 30-goal scorer. He is a really good he's, – he's, he's grown through his career in the NHL, and I think he's going to do – really good things for the Sharks. and He's going to get, obviously, a lot more minutes. So we'll see with the Panthers. Um, let's talk Boston, who lost a lot this offseason. Not only did they win the President's Trophy last year, they got, they got kind of steamrolled in the playoffs. Um, they've lost their captain. They've lost um, other players that have, that have went other places that are kind of big veteran players and that have a lot of experience. Um, they do still have a Jennings Trophy winning tandem in Swayman and Omark with a possibility of a repeat for that trophy since the Bees play a good two-way game in front of the netminders. Um, they're a good defensive team. Um, their forwards play great um, two-way, two-way hockey. So I still think the, I think the, uh, the Brewers are going in. So, so in the Atlantic, that puts us with the Leafs, the Panthers, and the Bruins who will fill that spot. But there's one spot we have to talk about. And, of course, I know a lot about this team. And actually, when doing a little research about the other team, I found some very interesting and very similar parts of their team. Buffalo and Detroit. I think watching these two teams play this year, I think people are going to be very, very um, happy with what they see. Um, both teams have young studs on D in Darwin and Cider. The thing that's amazing about them, and people, I didn't even kind of realize that in, in, my, in my head, was that they're only one year apart. Um, they're both growing, growing to be, you know, eventually probably a Norris Trophy can, uh, candidate. And, it, you know, they're both going to get massive money and um, be great for their team. Then we have the offense between the two of these teams. Now, it was different last year for both these teams, but both at 25 years of age, you've got Tage Thompson, who has, a written, like, the last two years has went up. Um, last year, a 40-goal scorer. And Alex Dabrinkat. Um, the thing that's interesting is Alex has 80 more goals in his career, so we shall see. Um but or will it be about goaltending with a future star in Devon Levi or a consistent year in Vili Husso, also one year apart in age? So the things the the, the Sabers and the Wings are so similar, it's kind of wild to think about. The difference last year was the Sabers played great on the road, um, while the Wings not so much, um, which ended up you know giving them about a ten point difference. So we shall see which one gets the fourth and final playoff spot. Um, I don't think Ottawa is going to be involved in this. I think Ottawa's good. I think Ottawa has a chance. Ottawa could completely um, bowl over my thought on this, but I think Buffalo or the Red Wings are going to get this uh, that final spot. So let's discuss conference final. Um, I actually think this could be Toronto's year in that regard. Um, they've got the right, they've got the right tools. They should have the right tools minus the, the bonehead Ryan Reeves move, but uh, Max Domi's looking really good. And uh, Tyler Bertuzzi, who is a pain in the butt to play against is their first is the first true pain in the butt to play against for the Leafs and that they've had in a long time. Um, Reeves will still hopefully realize that he needs to be a big hitter and he's got to start, um, he's got to he's got to hit the treadmill a little more and get get some more speed, so that he's not just known as the as the chirper and the fighter. Um, I also think the Canes are going to be playing against Toronto in the conference final, but the Canes are just loaded, and unless goaltending um, lets them down, they are ready to go for it. The Canes have have added they've added every year. They're so loaded. They remind me of the 2002 Wings. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of guys who are going to go to the Hall of Fame that are playing are going to play for the Canes this year, but they're a very loaded team. So 
I think the Canes are going to upset the Maple Leafs. Um, don't get me wrong, and I want to make this clear. For the game of hockey, I feel like Toronto needs to win a Stanley Cup. But I don't think it's going to happen this year. I really don't. And that's unfortunate. And I know it's unfortunate for Toronto fans. It's unfortunate for, for uh, you know, kind of, you know, a capital of hockey between Toronto and Montreal. And I just think that um, this isn't going to be the year. I actually think, unfortunately, as much as I love um, the cold parts of, the, of uh, America and Canada being kind of the ones that are in the playoffs, I really think it's going to be a Carolina versus Stars it's, uh, versus Dallas Star um, Stanley Cup final. And I actually have, I think the Canes will win the cup this year. Um, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a tough one between the Canes and the stars, but I think that they've got the weapons to do that. Now the season starts this week and we've got a lot, we've got 84 games for every team to get there. Um, and then all, and then trying to win 16, but uh, you know, we'll talk more about it as, as the, uh, the league and the season kind of moves organically. So hopefully um, we'll be adding more of more listeners and more people um, to this, uh, to this, to this podcast. And I hope you guys, I want you guys to comment on all my stuff and tell me I'm, you know, right or wrong or whatever. Um, Cause it's, there's no fun thing in hockey, but a little chirping and I can take it just as much as I can, as I can dish it out. Um, our guest this week is a person that I have, it, it's very, he, he's very close to me. Um, I've known him for years. He was one of uh, kind of the first people I met in when I first moved to New York in 2000. Um, my girlfriend at the time worked with him and there was really this kind of like, like awe to the fact that, um, I was a kid that was a painter in high school, um, hockey on the side, um, in the, in the evenings. Um, I was a kid that, you know, ended up going to college and, and learning to be a designer playing hockey on the side and beer leagues. So um, when I got to see, when I got to meet this real ultra famous um, artist, William Wegman, um, I'm like, oh, Mr. Wegman, how are you doing? And the first thing that Bill did is welcome me in as I wasn't, you know, shocked by his, uh, his amazing art career as the, uh, the well-known Weimaraner photographer. Um, and he brought me and, and, uh, and my girlfriend at the time into his family and we got to watch the kids and see the kids, uh, get into, um, this sport that I love so much in hockey. And I coached, I got to coach his son and you'll hear in this interview, the fact that, um, I kind of, I kind of pushed him over the, over the door, through the door a bit of, uh, of hockey, because I didn't find, I, after the first year knowing him, I finally found out that he played hockey growing up in, uh, just outside of Springfield, Mass. And he, um, he was even taking lessons by Eddie Shore. So, um, when I heard that a little, a little hair on my neck kind of moved a bit and I'm like, wow, this guy could probably still play. Because he was, you know, he was hitting the bike and he was in good shape, you know, and everything. Um, and his, when I met him, you think he was in his, in his late fifties. So, so anyway, we're going to move on to this great conversation with one of my truly, um, great friends and, um, also a, a, an amazing artist. And if you don't know about William Wegman, um, you should definitely look him up because it, he's all over the internet. You can find his entire life and career as an amazing artist. So here we go. We're going to move to, to Bill. Welcome to Cross Ice Pass. We've got a Holyoke, Massachusetts, suburb of Springfield um, um, man here. We've got a, he's a true Northeasterner, has lived all over the country, but uh, he is residing definitely in the Northeast, coached by Eddie Shore when he was younger, makes a mean cup of coffee, 
can talk to you for endless amounts of time about tons of subjects, not just art. He's a great family man. He's known as the Weimaraner photographer, but is truly so much more if you dive into his work, so many mediums, so many topics, and his 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 his, his, his self seems more at ease in front of canvas than maybe a seamless in, um, photography or film. Um, his work has been featured all over the world in so many books, websites, articles. You've had he's had some some fun work on Saturday Night Live, Nickelodeon, and of course many times in Sesame Street. Um, a true legendary art career. But today we're going to talk hockey, mostly. Um, <laughs> welcome, William Wegman. His friends call him Bill, and that's what I consider myself. So, um, welcome to Cross Ice Pass. Hi, Steve. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, what I've been doing with everybody is the first question is always kind of um, one they might have to dig into. It could be historic, it could be recent. But I'm trying to. I want to talk about your your fondest hockey memory. I think scoring my first goal uh, in open hockey in uh, at Chelsea Piers when you talked me into getting on the ice, and I celebrated like it was a Stanley Cup winning goal, it, and it just changed me. It really said, "Okay, that's." I was ignoring hockey for many years, and then it just brought me right back. That's great. Um, before the we other, jump into our relationship, because there's a sure. lot of it, um, I was going to say I was going to add one more amazing. Uh, yeah, give it situation where, um, you know, back in in my day in youth hockey, uh, we didn't wear face masks, and I clipped accidentally the best player on Cathedral High School classical. I played for classical in the face, and it cause a huge gash in his mouth and uh after the uh game in the parking lot uh one of their guys beat up our best player thinking that it was him that caused it ah you're one of those yeah. uh goons that off to the side a little bit too i, I knew right. you were i knew you have a little wild side on, on the ice bill i get it um Our, can i thing? add one more thing to highlight yeah, highlight? yeah. i played for classical and we tied one and lost 12 um, the year I played. And I scored the tying goal, which was a puck that got up on its end on its side and spun between the goalie's legs miraculously as though it was he was hypnotized. So <laughs> that's about it for my that's, highlights. Those are pretty great. Yeah. Because the, 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 the theme of this, of this uh, talk is a lot about coming back. And the main reason I, th I thought about you in this moment is that not only was I, you know, a, a bit of a, a bit, of, I had my eyes and ears to see that, that transition to coming back from not just an artist, but also an artist that has a tendency to, to have a bit of a hockey ad addiction as well, which is great. But um, the thing that's funny is that when I look through, there's so many things I can research about you, Bill, and it's, there's there's so many great things because you've, you've had such a great art career, but the thing that's very funny and there's a few things and it's funny because most of your most recent interviews and most recent uh, media they kind of always talk about well sometimes you'll see him at Chelsea Piers or sometimes he'll try to get away to get some ice time but uh, I'd really love to talk about what you like your your first time playing hockey and really what brought you into it. Well, as you know, I grew up back in, in New England where the winters were really cold and um there was a pond in my backyard like a few hundred yards into the woods that froze in November. Uh it was a foot deep and it was, you know, pretty good size. So that's that was my childhood rink. And uh there was also really good hockey, organized hockey. Uh, in East Long Meadow, this is the town that I grew up in, that there were two rinks and a little clubhouse, and they had outdoor games, and uh, I played that. I guess I was five or six or seven or something like that. And, okay. um, you know, I'd be out there shoveling snow off the pond, um, three feet of snow just to get ice. And uh, I had one other hockey buddy, 
Butch Holly was his name, and uh, we used to do all those dangly things together. So uh, that 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 was uh, that was the beginning, and uh, then I played. Um, uh, let's see the. Um, I play. I didn't get to play travel hockey. I remember seeing some some kids boarding a bus with hockey equipment. I said, "What? What are you doing? Oh, we got a game in Worcester, you know, thirty miles away. What?" No one ever told me about travel hockey, and I was really upset that I didn't hear about it. But um, no way, my parents were going to go for that. <laughs> so you know, I ended up playing. I didn't. Um, I played in high school, and that was it. I didn't uh, continue after that. So you, the so before you played high school, you just kind of, you were the, you were the goal scorer in the neighborhood, huh? <laughs> I was, uh, I thought I was good. I would have never made any good team. I really wanted to, um, I wanted to play college hockey and, uh, I didn't, I went to art school and they didn't have a hockey team and it's really a damn good thing that I went to art school rather than try to go play hockey for like UMass or someplace like that. Cause I never right. would have made a team like that. Yeah. No, that's funny because um, when I think about it, I, I, I went to art school too and art schools still don't have sports programs. So um, maybe some do, but uh, where I went uh, as well, not so much, but one thing that um, you've always told me about was, was when you were coached by Eddie Shore and there's a lot of really interesting, fun stuff about Eddie Shore. Eddie Shore was an overachiever for sure, player, coach, owner. I think as I've read his wife would take tickets at the door with her baby in, in her arm or something. And uh, Don Cherry quoted that um, that if you don't smarten up, they'll send you to Eddie Shore. And how, what was that? What was it like playing for playing for Eddie Shore? Was he just your was he your high school? Because I know he was the coach of everything, from what I hear. Well, no, we just took uh, we took, um, I guess, lessons with him. You know, we there was he gave clinics, and uh, so I did that. And we were definitely afraid of him. And <laughs> you, uh, I remember the one thing he taught me was to s sit like you're going to the toilet when you're skating. And that was sort of memorable and also creepy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was a big fan of the Springfield Indians, which he owned and and coached. So I used to I was a rink rat. I used to go to all the as many games as possible in Springfield. Well, and actually, Doc I Wesley noticed was a coach was a goalie then, and there was some really yeah. good players. Camille the Eel Henry played for them, and a lot well, of great players. I noticed in Don because I mean, for some reason, when Eddie Shorsha pops up online, so does Don Don Cherry. And I know Don Cherry was there just about the time I think you were in high school. I was in high school. I graduated in 61, so 58, 9, 60. So you got, you got to see, uh, hopefully you got to see Don Cherry, and I'm sure. And I heard that the Springfield Indians at the time were really, really amazing. So They were pretty good. And it was really a rundown, wonderful stadium. Um, just. And you, that's where we, when we played there, we got our skate sharp in there for like 50 cents, um, wooden floors all over and uh, orange. There was also, uh, when you play, there, there was, the bench was covered with orange peels because that's how we used to um, hydrate through <laughs> oranges. It's it's so funny because some of that sounds, sounds like it was a long time ago and so different, um, but a lot of it's still the same. I mean... I had orange peels growing up too. Uh, yeah. My mom would show up with a. My mom used to show up with cold cloths even on the rink. She's like, "Oh, Stephen, you need this on your forehead." So, I don't know what that what was all about. But my parents uh, just stayed away from my hockey. They didn't. They didn't have much to do with it. It was just yeah. me and my buddies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing about kind of when, since you went since when you kind of stepped away from it and went to art school and going through your art career and. You know, there was kind of a obviously a huge gap in, you know, before Atlas started playing uh, your son. So was there any was there any time time in that or anything in that time frame that you th made you think about hockey or was it just mostly focused on art? Well, it's pretty funny because I was teaching in was Madison, Wisconsin, the year they won the national championship. Al Arbor, I think, was the coach. 
I didn't go to one game. And my fellow teachers used to skate. Says, Come on, let's, we're going to play hockey down at the pond. No, I haven't played in like 10, 10 years. I'm, I'm too old. I'm not going to play. I really wish I had uh, listened to them and started playing then. But I didn't. Well, it's never – the good thing about hockey, and that's the – Kind of a good focus of of our talk is that it's never it's never too late. That's um, right. I you know, it's that... better for your it's better for your knees than basketball. I, I think when you're a certain age. Yeah. So so you know when I started playing again when I was fifty eight or sixty, I um, you know I was slightly overweight as everybody that age is, and uh, I lost like thirty pounds just <laughs> just skating my brains out but i used to play eight days a week you know i played yeah. uh and i did the thing called blue streak where you got on the hockey treadmill i played in in a league i played in i was friends with the general manager so i played staff skates uh then i did practices with uh with uh, some of the coaches so i was you know my my wife christine was a little perturbed she said i thought i married an artist, not a jock, but I, I definitely went over the top. Um, from, from well, I mean, it was from, just it was it was in there. It was definitely yeah. in there. Yeah. It just um, it took it took it, it took. I think um, just to kind of give some context, I actually coached Bill's son Atlas when I think Atlas was eight or nine. Yeah, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, twenty years ago, then he's yeah. twenty now, and kind of just. You know, and there's actually I, I literally have it written on my on my little my little question list, Bill, that it's it says it's kind of my fault because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it is because um, I remember um, telling you that it, do, it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter. I mean, anybody can play. Um, I played I, against grandfathers and, you know, four generations and things like that. And uh, I was really happy because as watching you as a, as, as a friend and as an artist that you, you definitely had an analytic kind of way of looking at things. And I'm like, if I tell Bill, he can play hockey again, I don't think he'll ever listen to me. And you started buying the gear and you started kind of digging into it. And, uh, um, I guess I was wrong. <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> um, one question that I'm kind of curious about, because I know that you were playing, you played so much. And I remember uh, I even have friends of mine that I kind of say, you got to wear, you got to put your stick on your, on your bike, like Bill Wegman. And they're <laughs> like, what do you mean? And I'm like, cause somehow you had all, you had your sticks. But meanwhile, you're, 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 you know, riding your dogs and, and everything else. And I'm, and I'm like, I don't know how Bill never wiped out. And I'm sure you might have once or twice, but you seem to always always have it together. And you I had a good have a separated movie. shoulder <laughs> yeah. from from one. But no, I had Atlas riding with the hockey bag and the two sticks, but it was only uh, like a half a mile from our house to the piers. Yeah, so it was not too risky. Yeah, no, and I um, I think the 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 word I thought about when you really started digging into it is just that your tenacity to, to follow through. And you, I, I really feel like you fell in love with the sport. And I think, I think even at minus hockey that if I just could see you like, like a Charlie Brown cartoon, just, just strolling around on the ice. I think um, you always had that kind of that glimmer in your eye. That was really lovely to see that, you know, for someone at your age at that time, I was, I was, uh, it was a pretty lovely thing to, to watch and also see that I'm sure, um, I guess that kind of goes to my next question is how did that, re how did that really build and help your relationship with you and, and Atlas? Well, you know, we played, um, together, uh, for a while. I was on the same team. I remember coming into the locker and, and, uh, this one kid said, is your grandson coming? Because, you know, I'm like 50 years older than him. So uh, I said, my son. Anyway, he was a really good player, thanks to you and some other coaches, Danny O'Brien, so forth. Really uh, developed him nicely. So uh, that was really fun being, we did scrimmages together and for a while I was on the same team. And uh, 
He was brutal towards me too. He would really <laughs> cut me any slack. Yeah, he was. Yeah. No, I really remember um, the one that one that one conversation you and I had about, and it's one of my proudest moments as a coach, even still, is you you were kind of you were kind of like worried about you know man, I really want him to to follow through with this, and you and I kind of discussed it and kind of just we kind of said you know let's let's just see give him a season and see how it goes and then he can throw him up throw him away if he if he doesn't like it after that mm-hmm. and that that one season just really that's all he needed and i know he still plays and that's such a lovely thing for me as, as his coach and as a friend of the family to to just see that's really nice yeah he's really good but he's not as driven as i am and uh and this makes me furious because he could have been really good you know he could have he could have played, you know, in a much higher division. He just wanted to school everybody. So he stayed where he was. <laughs> and he still likes skating on the ponds and doing crazy tricks. So we do that together now. Um, it's, it's, it's funny to think about, too, the fact that your, your adult hockey career is just over 20 years. And yes. Which yes. Is, is kind of crazy to, to think about because I know um, – your 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 birthday's coming up in December and is is one thing I've always been curious about cuz especially now cuz you know cuz of covid and certain things that we um we don't get to 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 have a conversation often I'm kind of curious though how hockey has found its way into your into your work well, you know, it really hasn't, and that I really like. I like that it's just, you know, the whole other thing. It's, uh, it, you know, I'm passionate about both, but I'm more apt to share stories, hockey stories and art stories at this point. Uh, that may not have been true in the 60s and uh, and so forth in the 70s, but it is now. And uh, now I'm, I'm getting to play with, uh, and I'm in a senior group. I play with an over-60 group. Uh, now that I'm living more upstate uh, when I'm back from Maine. So I play twice a week with a group um, and I'll be 80 in December. And uh, there's a couple guys that age. And, um, but it's, you know, it, it's great. It's, it's really great to uh, hang out with people your, your own age. Um, which, uh, which rink is on usually if there's, it's the uh, Schenectady County rink near the airport. And, uh, it's about a 45 minute drive from my house upstate, but, uh, it's something okay. that I'm really crazy about doing. So no, I'm, I mean, there's, there's like, uh, it's like an hour and a half hour 45 for $9. So <laughs> it's really a good bargain except for yeah. the gas price. But, oh yeah. In comparison to, to even, was, even the fact that you live so close to the rink in New York, that's, <laughs> that's yeah. a huge cost savings. Yeah, it is. I still keep a locker there, even though I use it twice a year, but right. we'll see about how that goes. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll see you around there soon. Um, for sure. I'm always, I don't know if you've ever heard of this one thing. Now that you say you're in an over 60 league, there is a tournament that's at the, the Charles Schultz arena yeah, I think in Colorado. And a lot of guys that do it are kind of over 60. And I, I saw it as a, on a story in the New York Times, and um, I'm like, man, Bill would be great for that if he was on a team, because I didn't know if you were on a team. So, gotta, I um, played in a couple tournaments, and I was really shocked that I wasn't uh, dominating. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of guys my age that are good. We yeah. played a group in down in uh, in Florida, and some of them played for the LA Kings, and one happened to be Atlas coach in uh, in uh, Minnesota. At a camp once, uh, Jensen is his name. Okay. Steve Jensen, I guess. Yeah. So those guys killed us, you know. <laughs> but uh, whatever, you know. I think the I, th- I mean the the fact. Of course, I could say yeah, you're uh you've been an adult hockey player for twenty years, but also you've been kind of a you grew up around the sport. You played when you were a kid, and I'm always kind of curious when I talk to someone that has that kind of spanning time and curious about your seeing the evolution of the sport and watching it now. And even just in the last 20 years, it's unbelievably different. 
but mm -hmm. I can't even imagine even still back back in the in the you know in the fifties and sixties what it was like. Well, you know, my father played with uh, magazines tied to his shins, um, and um, the shin pads we had were quite a bit better than that, but they were not nearly as good as the ones I'm playing with now. So yeah, this stuff has really evolved, and especially skates. I can't believe the skates that we used to skate with back in the fifties and forties. Just unbelievable. Yeah, and it's it's really funny. I see a lot of um, you know influencers and things like that are getting into old gear, and their ankles can't handle it because the old one, the old skates didn't seem to have any like ankle support. You just had to have strong ankles. Yeah. And the sticks are much lighter and more responsive now, too. Yeah. Wooden sticks. Yeah, and the skate, I mean, I can't even think about since, you know, since we got you to start playing these last 20 years, thinking about guys now like Connor McDavid and who has wizard feet, I call them, when he skates. So they're just, it's pretty wild to watch. And, yeah. you know, thinking about, you know, those times that you had rinks in in uh in rangely and things like that and i actually have a photo of skating on it, it must have been three degrees and in, in yes. range yeah i've skated uh the, the tournament was this year and it was 30 not windshield 30 below for this <laughs> uh tournament in rangely wow but well, at uh, least the ice was cold <laughs> yeah it was <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, um, actually, this year there wasn't. It was the first year I haven't been able to skate because it was warming. It was the year before that; it was thirty below. Yeah, yeah. Are you still flooding out the the tennis court? Uh, no, we don't do that. We just uh, there's a there's a pond in town that gets maintained, which is just you know a couple mile drive. Yeah, so we just go skate there, or or some some years there's no snow but perfect ice. You can skate for miles, and I've done that. That's nice. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, um, I got to get up there to visit you guys sometime just because I know, uh, for one thing, I know it's colder up there and I get actual winter up there because yeah, New York just doesn't right. get it anymore. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm sure that there's some pretty great places to, to get together and skate up there for sure. For sure. Um, well, Bill, I mean, having this, uh, this comeback for you has been, has been pretty great to be a part of. Um, it's been pretty lovely to watch you uh, evolve and stick to this, stick to this hockey addiction that, um, yes, um, our significant others and <laughs> some some don't quite understand how crazy it is, but um, it's uh, it it's it, I I think that I think that once and then you know this too. I mean, once you get really into it, it's a big part of. You know, it helps. It helps you be able to talk to people. You know, you can you can talk. I, as a designer myself, I don't have to talk about design. I can just talk about hockey, which is pretty great. Yeah. Well, I used up some of my other uh, extracurricular activities, so I don't uh, smoke or drink. I just play hockey. That's my obsession and my sin in a way. But it, uh, you know, fortunately, my wife Christine really is uh, happy that I'm doing that, especially. Lately, uh, since I don't play, as I said, eight days a week anymore, uh, you know, it's it, it's it's more moderate, but it's still passionate. Yeah, and I can't wait for uh, hockey season to start preseason in a few days. So, that, yeah, that's it's going to be I'll it's play. it's going to be interesting interesting season, especially yeah. for your Bruins and my Red Wings for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. it's going to be a, a fun one to watch and. I've been watching so many different leagues now, um, not just the NHL. So it's, uh, as usual, hockey is endless in, in, in my household. And I know that you keep an eye on it as much as possible as well. And right. even today, the big, uh, the big bad Bruin, Brad Marchand, was announced as the captain of the Bruins. That's right. So Interesting. Yeah. yeah it's right. it's, <laughs> it's kind of old school, but I kind of like it. So that's great, Bill. Um, again, thanks so much for talking with me. Um, this is going to be a pretty awesome episode. Um, it's uh, I, I, because I, everyone's like, oh, what are you, what NHLers are you going to get? 
And I'm like, I'm going to talk to William Wegman because I want to talk about something I know that he's truly passionate about. Um, and sometimes the NHLers, they played so much, they kind of lost that passion. So I'm happy yeah. to, to have you in my life and I have a person that's as passionate as you are about it. Thank you, Steve. Nice talking with you. Yes, same here. Well, that was uh, a pretty awesome chat with Bill. Um, Bill really, it's so funny because it's, I really wanted my conversation with him to not be um, driven through his art um, because he's been in so many places for, you know, so much time, so many high level media places, um, TV shows, interviews, all kinds of things um, regarding his life as um, a photographer, um, a painter and an artist uh, for so many years and is so well known in New York and is respected. So all over the world, but, um, I really loved, you know, talking about his passion for this sport. And I really wanted to, to talk with him. And the reason I wanted to talk with Bill and I wanted the listeners to understand why is that I want people to this podcast. I don't want to just talk about, you know, stories between, um, players and, you know, wild times having, you know, uh, um, too many beers or something. That stuff is easy to me to to talk about. I want to talk about the hockey universe. And a lot of that has to do with um, players that are older, guys that are that are playing through, you know, generations and generations. The reason that I thought it was going to be that it was OK to approach Bill um, to play when his son was playing and I know that he was, uh, you know, he was ready to do it and he got all the gear and he was so ready to do it was that um, I think that it's good to know that I want people that watch hockey, that play hockey. I don't want people to real to think that it's just like, okay, after 45, you stop playing. Hockey is a lifestyle. Hockey is something that it's really hard to, to let go of. And I hope that I get to play until I'm 80. Um, because I don't know, I don't know what I would do without it. I mean, it's kind of like that meme um, about uh, I don't know what I can do. I don't know what I can do, um, but the uh, it's really it's really beneficial to know that you know it's been a huge part of his life. Um, it's been a huge part of his relationship with his son and his family. Um, outside of being this you know ultra famous, um, ultra uh, well known artist, it's um, it's pretty great. I'm glad I got to talk with Bill and I'm glad you guys got to, to listen to to such a great, empathetic, amazing person that um, I think of him as. So I'm happy that, that, uh, that, that uh, you like that. If you have any comments or any questions about anything that I, that, you know, about Bill Wegman and about his life of hockey or art, um, definitely reach out to him, follow him and, and, uh, and, and all of his endeavors, he's constantly making art. He never stops. So, um, I think it would be a joy for, for, um, people that don't know about William Wegman to be a fan of his. Um, I think that's it for episode five guys. I mean, by the time we'll be at episode six, we'll be right, right in our, in the beginning of our NHL season. And, um, we'll be able to talk about some of the things and some of the happenings that are happening there. Um, Again, every episode I like to, you, you heard at the beginning of this, every episode I really like to feature um, a friend or a family or a friend of a friend's band. Uh, this is a band that is um, my, my colleague and friend, um, Andy Oglesby, uh, who works with me um, in my normal day job. He is a really great musician. He respects a lot of history of music, um, and he has really made some really cool music um, through his uh, through his uh, his music career outside of his his career as a designer. Um, I was really able, really happy to get his amazing rock punk band, um, Hank Forth. Has nothing to do with Hank Williams. Um, I'm still trying to figure out uh, why he called it Hank Forth, Hank For, but um, I'll make sure you guys can look below and get the links to that. Listen to their band. It's it's really awesome. Really energetic punk. If you need a new uh, a new playlist or new music to add to your uh, 
your pump up playlist before you go play hockey, um, definitely add some tracks from that band. So um, here we go. Uh, on to next episode, and um, here we go. Here we go.